All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our program today. My name is Katie Nowak, and I am the manager uh, for um, Ohio History Center programs. I'm so pleased to welcome our two guests to the History Center, uh, both of whom hold vast amounts of knowledge about America's space exploration program. Before we get started, I want to go over just some housekeeping, how our program will run today. Um, first, uh, our, one of our speakers will give us a brief overview of um, space exploration history. Uh, then we'll get into some conversation and some questions. And then if you have questions in the audience, um, you are welcome to raise your hand and we will come through and um, kind of help you ask those questions. Um, for those of you who are attending uh, virtually, um, including my dad, hello. Um, <laughs> we don't have the capacity right now to have you um, have your questions live. However, you can email us. So if you email us at info at ohiohistory.org and you have the subject heading as uh, reporting Apollo, we will compile those questions for you and then we will we'll get answers for you as well. So um, now we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce um, both of our speakers. Um, the first is going to be Mr. Greg Brown. He is the Historian and Collections Coordinator at the Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio. His duties include public speaking, research, and writing interpretive content for the collections and artifacts. He served on active duty with the United States Air Force as a missile security specialist and with the U.S. Army in the Military Police Corps. He has a BA in history. Uh, and if you are a member or frequent visitor to the History Center, uh, you may have seen Greg before, but you may not have recognized him. He usually is our astronaut at our annual night, the museum event. So his face is usually hidden. Uh, so, uh, Greg, would you... I'm giving everyone away. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and then our um, next speaker today uh, is Jim Slade. As a journalist, Jim Slade has witnessed some of the truly pivotal events of this century. His coverage of the American Space Program began with Alan Shepard's launch in 1961. As its science correspondent, Jim Slade, Jim Slade led coverage of space, science, and technology issues for ABC television and radio news from 1988 through 2001. He worked in a similar capacity at the Mutual Broadcasting System from 76 to 88 and the Westinghouse Broadcasting Company from 1961 to 1976, a career which allowed him to witness the first 40 years of world spaceflight firsthand. As a science writer, his stories range from exploration to education, archaeology to high-speed computers. Slade prides himself um, on being able to see both the woods and the trees at the same time. A journalist who has always dealt personally with the astronauts, engineers, and scientists who made it happen, he describes the Apollo moon landing program as a prime turn in human evolution, and he shows you why. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Greg Brown and uh, Mr. Jim Slade. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. So I want to thank, first of all, Katie and OHC for inviting me and Jim here. Uh, thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here. So we want to talk a little bit about the early program. Uh, to get this thing started. And so right away, we just heard Katie talk about Alan Shepard's flight. Do any of you, are any of you aware that today is Alan Shepard's 100th birthday? Born in East Derry, New Hampshire in 1923 on this date. So that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, but let's talk about the beginning of the space race first. So if you recall, and some of you may have been around then, uh, in the first week of October 1957, the Soviets, then our enemy, of course, launched Sputnik 1, the very first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth. Okay, so they got ahead of us. We lagged them for about eight years, but um, the very next year, the U.S. got into the act. So in 1958, in January, uh, we, we took a big step. So I like to say that 1958 was a very good year for our program. And here's why. Explorer 1 was the first 
artificial satellite launched into orbit by our country, and that was in January. And then legislatively speaking, NASA was born in July. President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act in July. And then NASA began to function operationally in October of that year, October 1st. And uh, a week later, Project Mercury was approved. It was not actually announced to the public until December of that year. But I was born the next month. That's kind of nice, right? And, and those of you who remember what a 1958 Chevy looked like, they were pretty too. So, so 58 was pretty good, right? For some of us anyway. Uh, so Project Mercury was born, and this was the first steps, and there were baby steps, that our country would take in outer space, in, in orbit. We want to be able to get into orbit with human beings, and this is, again, something nobody has ever done. So Mercury was tasked with taking those first steps, and one of the things we wanted to do was make advances in communications and in rocketry and in life support. We had to do that. Uh, one of the credos of the early program was we try to use as many off-the-shelf components as we could, and this would expedite the development of our program, and it would also cost less, okay? So that's always nice. Uh, and we could do that with, with Mercury, uh, not so much with Gemini and, and Apollo, but at any rate, that's one of the things we wanted to do. But there were three primary objectives with Project Mercury. One, place a human being into Earth orbit. That was a big job. That was a big job. Second, we want to investigate and assess the man's response, the human being's reactions and response and performance in that space environment. And thirdly, we want to return the human and the spacecraft safely. Well, at least return the spacecraft safely. Anyway, that's supposed to be a joke. Boy, you guys are a tough audience. I had dreams about being in Vegas. I think those are shot now. All right, so anyway, we want to return those people back to Earth, all right? Now, we have some astronauts that had to be selected. Nobody had, had ever been selected as an astronaut before. We didn't need them before. So in April of 59, we select seven men. We know them as the Mercury Seven. And of course, Ohio and John Glenn uh, is one of those men. So we start out slowly. We put both uh, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom on a redstone rocket. They were very puny. Uh, they could not reach orbital velocity. But we have men in space. And we're still behind the Soviets, but we're making uh, strides. And then, if you recall, I'm sure you do, uh, February of 1962, we put Ohio and John Glenn in Earth orbit, and he becomes the first American to do so. Three orbits, uh, pretty limited, but this is a huge step forward. And I already mentioned that Alan Shepard turns 100 today. A very, very good pilot, by the way. Excellent pilot. So now, the Mercury spacecraft, relative to its successors, is fairly simple and fairly limited. For what it was designed to do, it was, it was very good, but it had some limitations. So, for example, it was not equipped with an onboard digital computer. It did not have any inertial guidance system. Uh, it could not be steered during reentry. Okay, so it was a zero-lift ballistic vehicle, but for the objective set forth for it, it was a wonderful spacecraft. But we need something more advanced to pick up the slack. Now, Jim's going to talk a little bit about this, but many people have this idea, this notion, that we flew these missions and we started these projects one after another, kind of serially, and that's in fact not true. They all actually were part of an overarching uh, philosophy and a program conceptually. So even though Mercury flew its astronauts first, Project Gemini and Project Apollo were both approved at the end of 1961. So even though we flew those uh, Mercury missions first, Gemini and Apollo were functioning behind the scenes simultaneously. This is something maybe some people have forgotten. So Gemini is a very ambitious project. So we have a bunch of stuff we have to learn in order to get to the moon and five primary objectives. Uh, 
there were many other subsidiary ones, but five primary ones. One, we have to rendezvous, that is, bring two spacecraft together in orbit. And of course, this has never been done, and the Soviets have not done it. Then we have to be able to dock or physically connect those two vehicles in orbit. And we have to be able to get two men, put them in a Gemini spacecraft in Earth orbit for two weeks. And you might wonder why two weeks? Well, we had to simulate the time necessary to go to the moon, land, play in the dirt, and come home. That would be a minimum of about eight days or so. But the last three Apollo missions would be 12, 12 and a half days. So that would allow us in Earth orbit where it's safer to hash this out. So that was a very important objective as well. Then we also have to be able to get the pilot, one of the men in the Gemini, outside the spacecraft and perform some experiments, test some equipment, and that would be important too. And then finally, we have to be able to make a precision landing on our return. Not for Gemini's own sake, but for Apollo's sake. Because if you recall, Apollo is coming back from the moon much faster than Earth orbital velocity. And it's coming back so fast that if they deviate from that uh, re-entry corridor by more than about two degrees, they'll die. So that's pretty important. So these things had to be hashed out, and in fact they were. Gemini spacecraft and the Mercury were both built by McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis. Uh, the Gemini was quite a bit different from the Mercury. It was more advanced. It was able to control its re-entry by steering. It had asymmetric mass distribution, so it had a little lift. It had an onboard digital computer. It had rendezvous radar. It was powered by fuel cells. This spacecraft was a phenomenal piece of engineering. We had two unmanned flights, uh, which were one and two, and then we had 10 manned flights over about 20 months, Gemini 3 through Gemini 12, and at the end of that time, in Gemini, uh, Gemini 12's mission in November of 66. So this month, in 1966, the last manned Gemini flew, and by that time, we had hashed out all of those critical and primary objectives that we would need. We have a couple of milestones real quick. Uh, Gemini 3, of course, the first manned Gemini, then Gemini 6 rendezvoused with Gemini 7. This is the first ever rendezvous. This was December 15th, 1965. And then we have Gemini 8. And this is kind of special and dear to my heart because we have the Gemini 8 spacecraft in our museum. So David Scott and Neil Armstrong performed the first ever docking exercise. And they also survive our program's first true in-flight emergency. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so this was really, really huge. We then wrap up Gemini, but Apollo is already ongoing. And Apollo now, we have even more aspirations, higher goals, because we've got to get to the moon. So the prime contractor for the two spacecraft were North American Rockwell and Grumman aircraft. And then the Saturn V was built by uh, Boeing, North American Rockwell, and McDonnell Douglas. We had 11 manned Apollo flights, which occurred between October of 68 and December of 72. Nine of those flights went to the moon. So anybody tells you we faked it, how are you going to fake that? You're going to fake nine times, really? That doesn't make sense. So out of the nine times we sent humans to the moon, we had plans to land seven times. <clears throat> We'll talk about this a little bit later. Apollo 13 was unable to land, but with aside from that, we had six successful landings on the surface of the moon between July of 69 and December of 72. So then uh, we had Apollo 13. We're, again, we're going to talk more about that. Apollo 13 uh, was really a, a kind of a test bed for, for problems. You know, we had all kinds of problems, and, and you're probably aware of that. Uh, nonetheless, successful return, uh, the American people kind of lost interest in, in the space program in a way. After that, they thought we'd lost those guys. But nonetheless, uh, NASA gets its budget cut, and we no longer are able to continue to go to the moon. The last three missions, 18, 19, and 20, were canceled. Following the Apollo lunar missions, we had uh, several crews, actually three crews, uh, for Apollo, the Apollo um, 
applications program, which was Skylab. So we had three human crews on Skylab uh, from 73 to 74. And then finally, we had a joint mission with the Soviet Union in 1975, Apollo Soyuz test program. And this, at least for a time, seemed to thaw our relations between the Soviet Union and ourselves, at least for a while. So at this point, I think I want to have Jim take over here for a while, and I want to ask Jim, what was it like starting out as a young reporter in 1961 in Florida with all of that ahead of us? Well, let me say at that time I was six foot three. <laughs> Business kind of wears you down. I was complaining about being old one time to a friend of mine who used to be the director of public affairs at Marshall. And he said, you're not old, you're historic. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm an artifact. And that's true. The first time I saw Cape Canaveral, 1961, was nothing like what you see today. David Brinkley later called the place Cape Carnival, and probably it was a good idea. But anyway, I arrived there, I was 24 years old. I was sent down there from my station at WOWO Fort Wayne. I'm sure you all know where that is. And the news director didn't want to go, so he sent me because I knew something about airplanes. I'd been around aircraft all my life. And uh, so I was, you know, just out of my mind. It was a wonderful thing. Here, here I'm being thrust into the middle of a world-class story not a national story, a world-class story. 24 years old, it was amazing. They got down there, rented a Volkswagen Bug over at uh, Orlando, which was more McCoy Air Force Base at the time. They specialized in B-52s. Landed there, got my luggage out of a, uh, a, I don't know, little shed. They didn't have a terminal. But Delta Airlines deposited me there, and I rented a Volkswagen, which I had never driven before. I think I went all the way across from Orlando to the uh, East Coast uh, in third gear, but that's okay. <laughs> Got there. The place between Highway A1A and the beach was a jungle. If you'd stuck your arm in that jungle, it would have been eaten off immediately by something you couldn't even see. Got to the intersection at the end of the causeway, turned right down A1A for three, four miles to a Holiday Inn, which was the most modern facility at Cocoa Beach at the time. Cocoa Beach was a fishing village and occasional surfer's haven uh, back at that time, and maybe 400 people lived there. They didn't know what was about to happen to them. But anyway, we got to uh, the Holiday Inn, and that's where the astronauts stayed when they weren't assigned to a flight. You know, just like ordinary human beings. Uh, and that's also where we, of the media, stayed. Because, not because the astronauts stayed there, or because, but it was nice. It was because it was the only thing that was there. Got there, and all my heroes were there. All my broadcasting and newspaper heroes were there. People from the New York Times, people from ABC, people from NBC, CBS. And here I am, a 24-year-old shirt-tailed kid with a crew cut, skinny, and I'm thrust into this august company all of a sudden. And there are even a couple of astronauts wandering around uh, because they needed to go find a sandwich somewhere. But anyway, got in there and we began studying what we were getting into and all of us were unprepared for what was going on. We were being briefed by the engineers once a day about what they were doing to put together the flight and I think that we were just about one day behind them uh, because it was all being put together piece by piece, as Greg says, off the shelf and stuff, new stuff was arriving every day. Mercury, uh, he described it very nicely. Mercury was a cannonball. It was a cannonball with a person aboard. It was, it was meant to make sure uh, 
that you could send a person out there and they could survive and you know, tell you what the view was and come back safely, have the equipment that would support them. Meanwhile, people in other parts of the country, 400,000 people, by the way, earned their living off the Apollo program. 400,000 people, 12 major companies put it together. They were all private companies. The government contracted with those people to get it done. Although the con uh, government did have a, a crew of engineers at Langley Air Force Base that were able to uh, design the spacecraft, the basic spacecraft, and give it to McDonnell in St. Louis and say, put this together. And, and that's, that's pretty much how it was done. It was not a very big organization. It, at that time, we could get to know most everybody we needed to know on a one-to-one -one basis. It was that small. We would see the best of their engineers at our briefings every day. These are the guys that rose in the ranks because they were able to communicate. Chris Kraft, Chuck Berry, people like that, Charles Matthews, these were giants, although they didn't know it at the time. They were struggling to decide how to do something that had never been done before. It was an amazing time, just an absolutely amazing time. It was a great place to put a rocket base. Patrick Air Force Base was down south of us there at Cocoa Beach, and that became the the Center Air Force's headquarters for rocket testing up at Cape Canaveral. And if you ever take a look at a map, you'll see how Cape Canaveral elbows out into the Atlantic Ocean. Well, go southeast from Cape Canaveral, you've got a 5,000 mile stretch of water so that you could drop a lot of busted rockets and not hurt anybody. And that's why the base was so, so good for what NASA was about to do. Uh, that the, there was another factor there. Since the Earth rotates to the east, when you launch to the east from Cape Canaveral, you get about a thousand mile per hour kick in the butt, and that's a nice thing. So it was a good place to go. Uh, you talk about launching from the west coast from Vandenberg Air Force Base, that's on a north-south orbit around the poles. Uh, they don't worry, rely on the Earth's rotation for anything from there. So you've got those two segments. Anyway, I remember going out to the, to the Cape for the very first time. And driving out, we just showed our press badges. We just showed our press badges at the gate and we drove in. We drove our own cars in. They had us in a press site that was maybe two, three acres. Have you ever seen it there? Okay, it's a, it was a dirt mound. The Air Force's hangars were up here. The rocket hangars were up, up here. This is on Cape Canaveral. And we had a dirt mound, and we were about a mile and a half away from the launch pad where the Mercury Atlas was about to launch. You know, and, and down to the south of that was where the Redstones launched with Grissom and, and Shepard. And here we were, about a mile and a half. And that, that rocket, every rocket I've ever seen looks big. And, and then you get to other rockets and they look bigger and more sophisticated. But the Atlas, the Atlas V was a pretty good looking rocket. And we could see it in fairly good detail. They, we were here at the, at the press site and the blockhouse was over here, and they had a good view right straight out of the window at, at the, the launch site. Uh, it was jungle out there too. Anybody that tells you that we weren't confined in a space didn't know the logistics because there was only one road into the, to the press site, and that was the only way to get out to. You're not gonna wander off because if you did, you were gonna go into mosquitoes and alligators. And we didn't want to do that either. It was an amazing time. We, the broadcasters, we needed a place to work where we could isolate sound. Uh, the newspaper guys had a bank of telephones outside on the mound. And they could 
be on the line with their city desks, with their desks, national desks, yeah, uh, uh, while the launch was going on. But we, we needed trailers. So we had this awful conglomeration of camping trailers set up. And what was really nice is because we had those trailers, they were air conditioned. But what you would do would you would aim it toward the launch site and that big window at the end of all campers was what we used as our studio window. When the rockets, it didn't matter what kind, Atlas, Titan, Saturn, when the rockets took off, you felt it in your bones, you felt it in the floor of the trailer, the microphone did this in front of you, and it was an amazing thing. It was worth the whole trip. The first, that, that, that one minute, and maybe minute and a half, was worth the whole trip. When I finally did that, the broadcast with, we had a team that time, everybody sent teams. And uh, we had a team of reporters there, and I was in the middle of this. And when we finally finished the broadcast and we were driving out, I said to the boss, I got to see that again. <laughs> I said, I, I really don't believe what I saw. So that's how that began. I ended up going to each and every one of them until finally it got so expensive that I was the only one of the team that they sent, me and an engineer. And uh, the whole thing was mixed and sent to the stations uh, at the headquarters in Washington. And that's the way we did that. And it was called remote broadcasting. But Mercury was a really interesting little spacecraft. Uh, there wasn't much there. And they hired test pilots. I you know, got down there, and, and I, I told you that I was sent because I knew a lot about aircraft at the time. I've been a pilot most of my life. And I remember looking inside the Mercury. They had a, one sitting out there, looking in. And the first question was, where are the rudder pedals? <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with airplanes. It was a whole different concept. It was something we had to learn as we went along, and believe me, we were scrambling to pick it up. But it was fascinating. Now, the space suit that the Mercury astronauts wore was a Navy space suit. They had been using that on high altitude aircraft flight for, for quite a while. It was slender, it, it, fit, it fit the astronaut very tightly, but there was a reason for that. Uh, there was not enough room for the kind of spacesuits that we've become uh, used to looking at. Uh, the great big bulky suits that looks like it swallowed the astronaut alive. No, this thing was skin tight. And the seat inside the Mercury spacecraft had been molded to each and every astronaut's body. That's so that when the forces of liftoff pressed him back, there was nothing pushing against him. Uh, each one of them had their own seat installed in their spacecraft. Uh, it was a fascinating thing to see. And we thought, of course, that was the ultimate until we saw Gemini. Well, the, the engineers called it Gemini. It was Gemini, as we all know. But uh, the, the trade name was Gemini. We saw Gemini. And that looked like a Cadillac. Two seats, boy. Ejection seats. They had ejection seats in that spacecraft because uh, uh, they're just, well, they wanted to try that. They wanted to do it. And it had, it had a good reason for putting that in. And those were, were borrowed from the SR-71, the Blackbird. Uh, those seats, they never had to use them, thank the Lord. They did have, uh, during the, the course of the uh, Gemini program, they had a couple of shutdowns on the pad. Uh, and, and, and that's where it got interesting. Uh, one where Wally Sharon and Tom Stafford were aboard Gemini 6. Uh, it shut down. And I heard, I heard the tapes later. Sharon, who was a prankster and a, had, a, had a great sense of humor, I could hear him giggling in the background, and I could hear Tom Stafford uh, 
saying words that I had never heard before, and it went on for four minutes without repeating. <laughs> and it began, this is the fourth time I've been up on this thing, and <laughs> it went on from there. He was a colorful character and still is. I don't know where, where you want to go with all of this, uh, but my memories of it are so vivid. Uh, I'm 87 years old on December 4th. I remember all the stuff that you were talking about. You know, I saw all those things happen. Uh, I also remember from my own research over the years how it all flowed together. After World War II, when we got the German scientists, there was a division of labor. We also got out of the Germans pretty good stuff on jet engines. And so the line of research diverged. Some people went jets, some people went rockets. Uh, but the people over here in rockets were borrowing a lot from the people over here in jets and on back to World War II. There's an awful lot of World War II class equipment in the Mercury spacecraft uh, later on uh, in the Gemini, not so much, because by that time they had gotten up to, to speed in, in knowing what they needed. I, I used to call it invention on demand. Greg mentions the, the computer that ended up in the Gemini spacecraft. I remember when my friend Chris Kraft went to IBM. Well, let me say before that, the Mercury spacecraft was largely controlled from the ground from a huge room full of computers. The whole flight was pre-programmed and put on tape before it ever lifted off. And it, if it followed that program, all well and good. Kraft went to IBM and he said, I need a computer, and remember the time this was, this was in the early 60s. He said, I need a computer that can ride in the spacecraft and control the spacecraft in real time with input from both the astronauts and the ground. Well, when IBM picked themselves up off the floor, they go, went ahead and invented it, and it weighed 93 pounds. It was a spacecraft a computer of that size that took us to the moon. It was an amazing, amazing thing. But that was invention on demand. At that time, people were coming up with problems, and they had to actually invent new ways of solving them. The fallout, hey, you like your telephone? Hey, thank the people from Apollo because that's the type of stuff that had to be done in order to miniaturize everything enough to ride on a weight-limited rocket. Now, Saturn V could launch 100,000 pounds out of our solar system. 100,000 pounds. But in the big picture, that was just barely enough. That just barely did it to get us to the moon and back. The computer on the Saturn V, what, had 120 megs? It didn't even have that much. Yeah, it was, it was less it was than your... 72K, yeah. roughly about 72K. Yeah, less than your wristwatch today. That's what steered us on the way to the moon. Saturn V was an amazing machine, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And so what about Scott Carpenter's flight? You mentioned a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, Scott became a friend of mine. I wasn't too friendly with him, happy with him at about the time, but uh, uh, he launched, uh, he, was, he was the backup guy to John Glenn, so he got the next flight. That was the usual root, uh, routine. And so his flight, uh, he went into orbit and everybody suspected that he did a lot of noodling around with the controls. He, Scott was up there. He wanted to see what he was getting into. He, he wanted to see the view. He played with it a bit, but that wasn't really it. There was a problem that uh, occurred that uh, fouled up the reentry. And uh, Scott, as a matter of fact, went 300, 
250 maybe? 250 miles overshoot downrange. And they didn't know where he was. The communications weren't that bad, weren't that good because at that time, the NASA communication system was largely three big antenna farms uh, at equal locations around the Earth. And once you flew out of range of any of those antenna farms, uh, you were in radio silence. Uh, it wasn't until we got into uh, to Apollo and uh, just late in Gemini that they had a system of satellites that would give them almost constant communication as the spacecraft flew around the Earth and onto the moon. But in those days, it was no communication. And so for three and a half hours, I and my friends had to sit on the air and ad lib, wondering where Scott Carpenter was, telling stories and telling them again, and, and even testing and uh, tasting uh, astronaut food. Uh, it tasted like peanut butter. Uh, we did that for three and a half hours until they finally found him uh, way downrange, not where he was supposed to land. And for some reason, they blamed it on Scott, and he never got to fly again. Yeah, it's true that um, he was downrange too much, um, a lot further than he had planned to be, but his pitch scanner was malfunctioning. And on Mercury, since you could not steer through reentry, you had to line up for retrofire, and that determined your flight path angle. Yeah, they had, a, they had a scribed line on the windshield, and he lined mm -hmm. that up with the, with the horizon. Yep. And then, then fire his retro rockets. The spacecraft was nose down about like this when they uh, fired the retro rockets and it began a ballistic arc yep. down to the ground. Yep. The right amount of energy was put in at retro fire, you would land on, approximately on the spot they planned. Yeah, it was not until Gemini that you could actually put your spacecraft right down where you wanted it to be. Um, how about let's talk a little bit about Gemini 8. Gemini 8? Gemini 8, yeah, that, that was a, a doozy. You had Neil Armstrong and... Uh, Dave Scott. Uh, yeah, uh, Dave Scott. I'm, I'm having a, an old man's problem here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> they, uh, they launched on what was supposed to be a three or four day mission. And they, they, uh, it was one of the most amazing things because they, they, they uh, launched to catch an Agena rocket that had been launched just before them. And in, in uh, I think on the fourth orbit, they, 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 rendezvoused. They, they rendezvoused with it, which was proving that you could do that at the moon when it became time to come back up from the moon and rejoin the uh, Apollo sp uh, spacecraft. But they got docked, and it was a beautiful thing, and they had missed this a couple, on a couple of previous flights. They finally got it right on eight, and it was very smooth. They got in there on the, on the fourth orbit as they were supposed to. They, they maneuvered a little bit, uh, told the ground that it was very, very smooth operation and they were ha very happy with it. Uh, and then suddenly when it came time to back off a little bit, uh, Dave Scott noticed that the spacecraft was banking. Shouldn't be doing that. We should be lined up with the horizon, but it was starting to roll. And uh, Neil took over and started working on the problem, and Dave pushed the button to get them out of there and disconnect from the uh, Agino. Right. Uh, so Neil and Dave noticed that as soon as they pulled away from the Agino, the spacecraft started rolling faster. Well, it turned out that there was a thruster uh, on the, uh, uh, I call them steering thrusters for lack of, of you know, shorthand. That's close enough. Yeah, yeah a steering thruster on, on the back of the spacecraft was stuck open. Neil noticed uh, that the fuel for that thruster was going down, and that's what tipped him off to what the problem was, and he shut that system off and switched over to the thruster system that you would use on re-entry. Well, the, he got it stopped. Uh, I was 
monitoring this in my studio, and I went on the line to tell the, uh, tell the stations that you better stand by because we are in great danger of losing two astronauts tonight. And uh, so that alerted them, and the system went up, and we, we got very busy on it. Uh, once he got pulled back and discovered that the fuel flow was like that, uh, he switched over to the landing RCS, they call it, uh, retrofire system, or retro... retro Reentry control system, retro, yeah. Yeah, re action control system. Okay. Uh, he went to that one because it was available and, and powerful, and it got the roll stopped. And the mission rules were that any time that you fire those rockets, okay, next orbit, you're coming home. And that's what they did. They ended the three-day mission in the same day, and it was one of those things that NASA got the reputation for being able to pull its irons out of the fire when it was necessary. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to Apollo 13. But they, they did an accurate landing to uh, a place in the Pacific where there was a backup uh, ship waiting for them and, uh, and, and made it home. But that was the first time that Neil Armstrong uh, became a major player in the, in, in the whole program. Uh, a masterful pilot, a very cool head. He got it done before they got to the point where they were going to black out. The thing was revol revolving so fast that they were getting a centrifugal force that was really pinning them to the side of the spacecraft. And when you've been in weightlessness for that long period of time and suddenly your head slammed against the wall, you begin to think, we got a problem. It was, it was amazing. We do want to mention at this time that not only did those two men solve that problem, but they did so while they were out of radio contact. That's right. That's right. That was pretty hairy. Further and, and cover some more Gemini, or do you want to just move into Apollo, Apollo 1? Let's go to Apollo. Okay. That's fine. So what about that fire? What about that fire? That was uh, one of those deals where you're getting on a hurry, and the hurrier you go, the behinder you get. Uh, the spacecraft was not the full-blown spacecraft that they were going to use in orbit. It was basically a, a early test model. Yeah, they called it Block 1. Yeah, Block 1. Block 1. And uh, it, it wasn't outfitted the way that they would outfit it to go to the moon. Uh, and they were using a pure oxygen atmosphere for the astronauts to breathe in, in the spacecraft. This was a test on the pad. This wasn't meant to fly that day. It was a test on the pad, and they were all in there running through the systems to, to see if it, if it was going to be able to go to launch. And there was a bare wire. Sorry. And it caught fire, and they were dead within 12 seconds. Uh, that began a, a, a system. We wouldn't do it this way today, but in those days, uh, the astronauts investigated the accident themselves. The astronauts Frank, Frank Borman especially, he was Frank the... Frank Borman was the chairman of the investigating group, and it took 18 months. It took a long time, but, but what happened was out of that fire came the spacecraft that eventually went to the moon, a much improved model, and largely that was due to Frank Borman, who just passed away a week ago, that was largely due to him being a tough, hard-nosed honcho. And he put the manufacturers and the engineers through the ringer. And they, because, hey, he was going to fly on that thing. And they came up with an improved, one of the things they did was a, a hatch. Change the hatch. The, the hatch. You couldn't get out of that hatch uh, in an emergency. It, and it, it opened inwardly, yeah, the original it, one. It had to be unscrewed, and, and uh, it, it was bad. And the one that they uh, finally came to grips with after the fire 
was one you could pump a handle above your head a couple of times and up she goes and out you are. Uh, Apollo was an amazing spacecraft when you compared it to what we had before. Can you imagine two weeks in Gemini? Can you imagine, can you imagine what it smelled like? <laughs> but well, they said it got pretty ripe in there. Yes, it did. But in Apollo, you could stand up. Uh, there was a toilet, sort of. <laughs> there was a navigation station down below. It was about the size of a Volkswagen bus. And for astronauts, that was a real luxury. Uh, the seats were made side by side, three of them, so you could sleep in them, or you could sleep in a bag underneath the underneath seats. There was and that you could fold those room. seats back, too. Yeah, yeah. Fold and, them and out of the way. You know, you could have a dance if you wanted to. But uh, the thing was, was really pretty amazing compared to the, the scratch-it-together stuff we had had before. And when we got into Apollo, we really had to, to go to school. Uh, I remember uh, in, in those days uh, of, of high budgets, <laughs> I went to school to two or three places. I went to the Bendix School to learn about the, the computers that were aboard Apollo and how they worked. It was a basic, you know, three-day engineering course, uh, an introductory course. I did that with the lunar module in uh, Bethpage, New York. I went to the factory and did three days on the lunar module. And believe me, the lunar module, by the way, was not a fragile thing. It was built like a Grumman fighter that was made to land on aircraft decks. Uh, it was tough. And uh, that's what saved the Apollo 13's bacon. Uh, uh, they, we did it differently. We, did, we didn't just go read some wire copy and think we had it. We actually went, went places and learned how these things were done. I spent a lot of time at the North American plant in, in, uh, on the West Coast. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Houston. <laughs> I was in Houston when they were starting the Space Center, and he, NASA was in rented offices all over the city of, of Houston. Nothing was all pulled together. You went out to where they were building the Space Center. Thank you, Lyndon Johnson and Rice University. But you went out there, and you actually saw cattle in the field around the place where they were constructing the buildings that were going to be what became a beautiful potential university campus. Maybe one of these days it will be. A, you know, uh, but anyway, uh, it was a whole different thing, and, and it was so intense. We were so dedicated to the concept of landing a man on the moon in that decade. As a matter of fact, we landed four men on the moon in that decade and brought them back safely. Uh, we really capitalized on that promise. I've often thought that the Apollo program, including Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, which was a package, it was, was not separate programs, it was a package, as Greg has already said. Uh, I've often thought it supplanted a war. I really think that the effort that the two nations put into the concept of flying in space and going to the moon supplanted a war. Certainly the budgets were high enough that a war would have been a hard thing to swallow at the same time. We did have Vietnam going at the same time as the Apollo program. We did have that, and that was one of the reasons that President Nixon excused us from the last three flights. Too bad. We should have done the whole thing. My friend Gene Cernan was the, uh, my friend the late Gene Cernan, uh, was the last man to stand on the moon uh, in our history so far. And uh, he was dedicated to the proposition all his life that we would go back to the moon. He felt hurt. He felt that we had given up an advantage that we had and a new technology that we had developed 
we had sort of put it on the shelf and said, okay, that's good, we've done that, let's go do something else. And really, we had just opened up something. Apollo, friends, was an evolutionary change in humans, in human society, an evolutionary change. My father was a, a school principal, and he and I discussed the idea of space flight when I was just a kid, and he didn't think it could be done, because he did not think that an object in a vacuum can be navigated. He didn't think there was any way to steer an object in a vacuum. Uh, if he came back today, he died in 1954, God rest him. If he came back today, he and I couldn't talk about it. Because you and I, all the people in this room, we have a different language and a different concept of ourselves than we did before Apollo went to the moon. The first time an astronaut looked out the window and saw that blue marble in the black void of space, we changed. Suddenly we saw ourselves differently. Suddenly we thought about things that we thought were never possible. We suddenly saw it had a whole new horizon. Dad and I couldn't talk about that until he had gone to school and learned a lot of things that had taken place since he died. I've always thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could bring Thomas Jefferson back and put him in the middle of all this and watch him go? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Or Isaac Newton. Huh? Or Isaac Newton. Oh, Isaac Newton. Because that's how we got to the moon. Yeah, he'd be Kepler dancing, and Newton. He'd be yeah. dancing across the stage. I mean, it would be amazing. But we're different. Space has changed us, yeah. whether we have anything to do with it or not. Whether we were one of those 400,000 people who earned their living from the Apollo program. Doesn't matter. Space has changed us, and each and every one of us in the whole world has been changed because they now see the possibilities that they never dreamed of because of what we did in that amazing decade. I remember it so well, it's like yesterday, and I'm 87 years old, and I will go to my grave with those memories in my mind. So before we wrap this up, maybe um, talk a little bit about Apollo 13. <laughs> oh boy. I don't know if we can do it, but we'll try. We were at the Houston Spacecraft Center and Apollo 13 had been launched and we were all settled down for a long ride across the void between Earth and the moon. Uh, we'd done it before. It was, you know, we knew what to expect, we reporters. And, and, uh, and believe me, with exception, possible exception of myself, the cream of American journalism and worldwide journalism came to these flights. I met and knew people that were legendary in the journalism business, and they were there. Walter Sullivan of the New York Times, John Noble Wilford of the New York Times. I remember the first time I was walking, this was in the early Mercury days, I was walking down the sidewalk near the Holiday Inn, and there was a refrigerator truck parked there with the back end wide open. And the entire thing was full of 35 millimeter film. I said, oh, okay, uh, you gonna sell that? And the guy says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, that's for the National Geographic. That's when I knew that, buddy, you're in up to your ears. It's an amazing place that you've landed. And it became my life. But anyway, back to Apollo 13. Uh, we had wrapped up our broadcast day uh, and, and filed stories for the next morning and had, had gone off to dinner. I took my crew to uh, a really nice restaurant down the road from the Space Center. It was a good seafood restaurant that everybody liked to go to. Uh, 
and we were almost finished with dinner, and John Chancellor, you remember him from NBC, was sitting at a table next to us. I knew John, and it was nice. And he had a person from NBC with him, and John gets a phone call. Well, you know. He goes out, takes the phone call, comes back, sits down, and says, oh, apparently they've got an oxygen problem. Uh, they'll call us if they need us. Well, I paid the bill and got the heck out of there, got back to the space center, opened up just about the time that uh, they were deciding how they were going to proceed. Now, we were in a, a auditorium uh, lobby just across the aisle from the main administration building at NASA. And there were maybe three, four hundred people in that lobby at the time. Bro broadcasters and print journalists alike. And got back, got settled down, got the equipment switched back on. And so on my first report I said, all they've got is the lunar module. That will be their lifeboat. And my boss called me from Washington, and he said, you can't say that on the air. You don't know that. I said, the hell I don't. You sent me to school to learn that, and that's what's going to happen. And at about that time, Jim Lovell was saying, OK, we're opening up the LEM now. They went into the lunar module and fired it up. It had everything in, in moderation that the Apollo spacecraft had. It had navigation. It had propulsion. It had braking rockets. It was, it was a full, full spacecraft. It looked the way it looked. I, I know you have that in your mind because it was never meant to fly in an atmosphere. So it didn't have to be streamlined. All they did was they pinned up aircraft aluminum over the frame to cover the stuff they wanted to keep covered while it was flying on the way out there. So it looked weird. It looked like a big spider. But boy, it was some kind of a machine. They went in and fired it up and, and started uh, taking assessment of where they were. And, they decided that they were going to shut down Apollo entirely to preserve the batteries they would need for Apollo to fly them back into the atmosphere at the end of that trip. Uh, by that time, they were 55 hours into the mission. And they could see the moon up ahead, and they could see the Earth behind. That's about where they were on the way. Uh, truthfully, those three guys had no realistic expectation of survival. Apollo 13 was a blessing and a curse for NASA. Because once they had done all of this invention on the ground, going to the simulators there that were identical to the lunar module in orbit, or on the way to the moon, once they had done that, they, they saw what they had to work with. They started inventing ways for the guys to sustain their flight until the lunar module could duck behind the moon with Apollo attached to its top, duck behind the moon, and ride it out on the way around, give it a little propulsion to steer it, and head back to the Earth. Wow. I think, uh, personally, I was on the air steady for 36 hours. When I finally went to, the, went to bed in self-defense, got up the next day, the covers had not been wrinkled. <laughs> I'm telling you. But it, it was an amazing thing to see happen, and it was extremely delicate. When they came to the point where they were close to the atmosphere, they could drop off the lunar module, shut down, put it into an orbit of its own, out of the way, and rely on the 
spacecraft, the Apollo spacecraft, to fire up after dormancy for all those hours in extreme cold. Well, it did. The batteries came online. They dropped off the service module in the back that had all of the equipment that sustained them during flight. And that was when they first got the first view of that spacecraft. And I remember Jim Lovell reporting to Houston, and one whole side of that spacecraft is missing. What had happened was an oxygen bottle had exploded during a routine operation way back there when the trouble started. And it had virtually stripped the whole side off that spacecraft. You could see its innards back in that part. That part they didn't need anymore. All they had now was that 11,000 pound spacecraft it looked like a big gumdrop. And they, Lovell had to almost fly that by eye, coming back into the atmosphere. Had he gotten a, an angle too steep on the way into the atmosphere, the atmosphere would have deflected him, and he would have gone straight down into it and burnt to a crisp. Had he got too shallow an angle, he would have bounced off the atmosphere and gone into an orbit around the sun. It would have been a memorial in solar orbit. But he didn't. His mother said that my boy Jimmy could fly a washing machine. <laughs> and I, I guess he did. But he put it on the money, and he held it steady, and it was, OK, let me, let me do something for you. If you want to see what Jim Lovell did, go get a copy of the, the movie Apollo 13. That was amazingly accurate. NASA gave them everything they needed to do it right. Gave them even rides on the, on the Vomit Comet. Yeah, yeah where, where they take an airplane and fly these arcs. And what, at the top of the arc, you, you're weightless, and they get about 30 seconds. Some, some of the lines you see in that movie were given while these guys were floating around in that aircraft. Some of those were shot there. But the point of my diatribe is, if you want to see what Apollo 13 was really like, go get that movie. I had tears in my eyes coming out of that because I was reciting lines with those astronauts, with those actors, because I had heard them the first time before the actors. It was that accurate. Little tweaks, a couple of places, but if you want to see what it was like, just go get Apollo 13. Just to add a little bit of detail to their reentry. So on a reentry from the moon, your flight path angle can't be off by more than about two degrees. There's a reentry corridor that's two degrees wide. And Michael Collins, in his book, makes this amazing description or analogy of what that would be like. He said, it's like taking one, uh, one of your hairs, hanging it up, stepping back 20 feet, taking a razor blade, and hitting it. And yet, every single time we returned from the moon, we came smack down the middle of that corridor. Every single time. It was a beautiful thing to see. And uh, we were always glad to see the parachutes. <laughs> but uh, Apollo, uh, I've always thought that my career peaked when I was 36 years old because I had finished the Apollo program. I, th I thought, you know, it's not going to get any better than this. Kind of hard to top that, right? And I covered the space program, or the State Department and the White House and some at the Pentagon hated Capitol Hill. But I, I, co <laughs> I covered those, and believe me, nothing I did in Moscow, in Manila, or wherever else we went, had anything close to what I felt about Apollo. Apollo, we changed. We became a new bunch of people because of Apollo, of what we saw. <laughs>
of what we experienced or what we felt. Don't let anybody ever take that away from you. Jim, it sounds like you've done this before. You know how to perfectly wrap up. You What's know, that? It sounds like you've done this before. You perfectly can wrap up a session. <laughs> I'm a writer. Every story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. <laughs> Um, well, I would like to thank all of you for coming here today. Um, it, it's been amazing. I've certainly learned a lot, and um, it's been wonderful hearing both of you. Um, we will have this um, for um, view online through our YouTube channel, um, so we'll have the link um, available for that. Um, and then um, for anyone who was viewing online um, or anyone here, if you come up with questions that you were thinking about uh, later on, you can always contact us um, at info at ohiohistory.org, and we will get those questions to, uh, to Greg and Jim, and, and hopefully they'll answer them for you. So um, again, I want to thank you both um, so much for coming here today. Um, if you want to learn more about um, uh, space history, um, Neil Armstrong, uh, we have a bunch of amazing sites in our site system. So, of course, the Armstrong Air and Space Museum is a great place to start. Um, so if you have questions about that, we have site maps. We have all kinds of amazing information up at the front, and we would love to tell you more uh, about that. So um, please feel free to come and see us, and thank you again. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. So thanks.